Pro-choice will often say that one of the most annoying, most misrepresentative labels pro-life can attach to them is the baby killer label. No one likes being called a baby killer. I mean, have you seen babies? their cheeks and their big heads, but their arms and legs are still these short little stubs and they're just so disproportionate in a way that's just cute and adorable and stupid. The amount of serotonin I get from watching baby videos on TikTok is truly out of this world. It's kind of embarrassing. I definitely want to be a mother one day and I will smother that baby with love, but I am pro-choice and I am personally offended by the fact that you could ever consider calling me a baby killer. You traditional pro-lifers and pro-choicers are full of <laughs> So that was Michael Tooley. He wrote a philosophical paper in 1971 titled Abortion and Infanticide, in which he says that abortion is morally acceptable before the development of self-consciousness. Since a fetus does not gain self-consciousness at any trimester of pregnancy, then abortion is perfectly fine at any trimester, including the later ones. Oh my god, it's a man who supports pregnant persons' right to bodily autonomy. But don't celebrate too soon, or if you're a pro-lifer, don't get upset just yet. Tooley argues that since we don't see anything morally wrong with abortion according to his self-consciousness requirement, then killing newborn babies before they gain self-consciousness is also fine. He takes a radical stance of permitting infanticide in certain cases. Now, if you think it's just this one crazy guy in the 70s who said this, you'd be wrong. In 2012, Alberto Ghibellini and Francesca Minerva published a very controversial paper titled Afterbirth Abortion, Why Should the Baby Live? They too propose that in certain circumstances, and we'll talk about what those circumstances are later on, caregivers should have the option to kill, or as they like to say, abort, newborns. Unsurprisingly, this paper got tons of negative attention. I understand how unbelievable this position sounds. Need I remind you of my baby fever? But I would like us to all try to remember that these arguments come from a place of sincere philosophical reasoning. They are pro-choicers who genuinely think that they are being more considerate for burdened caregivers. Regina Rini wrote a paper in complete disagreement with this afterbirth abortion stance, but she still opens her paper with this. Unfortunately, some responses to GNM's paper have so far exhibited this discomfort in a dangerous way, trending toward abuse and even threats for the authors. I have no patience for such responses. GNM's argument deserves serious, sober-minded consideration, and the authors obviously deserve basic respect and decent treatment. My intention in this paper is to maintain all of these, while nevertheless arguing that the substance of GNM's paper is flawed. I think that taking these seemingly outrageous positions seriously only strengthens our own stance. I do believe it is important for pro-choice to clearly show why abortion and infanticide are not morally equivalent, even if it seems obvious to us. This distinction becomes especially crucial in the case of born-alive babies. Stick around for that because it can present a serious moral dilemma for pro-choice folks. Before we get into it, this video is sponsored by Babbel. As a Canadian, I learned French in school, but everyone here knows that the core French curriculum sucks. Students would be in eighth grade and still read sentences like Je suis un garçon. Now, I didn't really care how my French was. Don't talk Quebec. But as I got more into philosophy, there's lots of French philosophers that I'm interested in, like Sartre, Beauvoir, Voltaire, Lacan. Things can get lost in translation, and so it would be cool if this year I can improve my French and actually read some French philosophy in its native language. Babbel has been really great with helping me get back into French because there's so many different ways you can learn. They have like tons of live lessons here from real teachers, and then you also have a bunch of podcasts, games, and videos to watch. And I love the short 10 minute interactive lessons because I can just always pull it out whenever I have like a little bit of free time. 
all the lessons are designed by real language teachers. And if you're not feeling like Mr. Worldwide by the 20th day, there's a money back guarantee. If you're interested, which why wouldn't you be? Learning languages is so sexy. Go check out the link in my description box to get 65% off your subscription. A, a newborn child lacks the immediate capacity to make conscious, deliberate choices. So is infanticide okay? I think what we're here to talk about is abortion care. What you're describing is something that is already illegal and there are laws on the books for that. So I'm not a proponent. But of see, you understand if Dobbs, if Dobbs is handed down, the states will be able to make that decision and there are some that will go that far. You need to be aware of what we're talking about today. I'm out of time, I yield back. There are laws on the books Gentlemen's for that. Michael Tooley wants to figure out what property something must have in order to have a serious moral right to life. He makes two notes in the beginning of the paper. One, X has rights does not equal X has a right to life. It's common to assume that if you have any rights at all, then surely you have the most basic right, a right to be alive. But Tooley doesn't think so. For example, many people think that it's okay to kill a chicken, do a little butchering, maybe even hunt for fun, but significantly less people will be okay with continuously torturing a chicken for an hour. So the chicken has a right to not be tortured, but not a right to life. That's why people believe in humane butchering and humane hunting. Side note, I'm not sure how much I personally agree with this example. It's lacking details like how severe is this torture? Do I have an emotional connection to this chicken? But I do still agree that having any right doesn't necessitate having a right to life. Two, person and human being cannot be used interchangeably. Doing so plays in the favor of anti-abortionist positions, which Thule doesn't want. If we use person and human being to mean the same thing, then pro-choice is forced to claim that a fetus is, at least up to a certain point, not human. He says that even Judith Thompson, who wrote A Defense of Abortion, the argument showcased in Philosophy Tube's video, makes this mistake. Quote, I am inclined to think also that we shall probably have to agree that the fetus has already become a human person well before birth. Indeed, it comes as a surprise when one first learns how early in its life it begins to acquire human characteristics. By the 10th week, for example, it already has a face, arms and legs, fingers and toes, it has internal organs and brain activity is detectable. And Thule is like, yeah, I agree. Clearly the fetus is a human when it has all these physiological human characteristics. It belongs to this species Homo sapien. But growing thumbs is not morally significant. Whether a fetus has thumbs or not does not factor into whether abortion is permissible or not. It doesn't make someone a person. For Thule, a person is someone with a right to life, while a human being doesn't necessarily possess this right. This is because of his self-consciousness requirement. An organism possesses a serious right to life only if it possesses the concept of a self as a continuing subject of experiences and other mental states, and believes that it is itself such a continuing entity. Now, why does he say self-consciousness is the deciding factor for personhood? Well, he says a right is basically a desire someone has that others have a prima facie obligation to avoid getting in the way of. But of course, that desire has to belong to something conscious. I mean, it would be weird if we could say that phones have a right to, as One Direction once eloquently said, get some, because they desperately search for holes to fill when they're low on battery. And right to life doesn't concern continued existence only in a biological sense. If there was some future technology that suddenly planted entirely new memories, beliefs, and personality traits into your brain, surely your right to life has been violated. Yes, you have the same physical body. It doesn't seem to be your life anymore. Your life ended when every psychological and mental aspect of you was erased. Thus, what we really care about is the continuation of mental states and experiences. As I'm editing, I realize I want to explain this point a little further. Why does physical form not dictate a right to life? Why is it that just because a fetus looks human doesn't mean it's now morally equivalent to a born child? And it has fingernails! 
Well, if my mom suddenly turned into a tree, but kept all her memories, her beliefs, her need to know everything my sister and I talk about, I wouldn't be like, ah, my mom's dead because she doesn't have a liver anymore. No, I'd consider my mom is still alive. She doesn't have a human heartbeat, she doesn't have eyes or lips, but she's got her mental and psychological traits, and that's what matters. And then I'd probably go on some long magical journey trying to turn the tree back into my mom, but like someone tries to cut down the tree that is my mom and I'm protecting it like, no, that is my mom, not an actual common tree. Anyways, I suspect some people might go into the comments and say, oh, what a stupid example. It's actually biologically impossible for humans to live without a brain or heart. This is a false analogy, which is a common logical fallacy. And I can't believe you don't know that as a philosophy student. Yes, yes, I know that according to biological laws, we cannot have psychological states without our vital organs. But thought experiments don't have to, and usually aren't, confined by what's possible according to physical laws of our world. They are to check our reasoning, which is governed by laws of reason, not physical laws. I'm kind of getting off track now, so editing Olivia is signing off. Okay, so someone with a right to life is someone who desires to continue existing as a subject of their own experiences and mental states. The question is, can a fetus do this? And the answer strongly seems to be no. A fetus cannot desire continued existence as a subject of its own experiences and mental states because it has no idea what continued existence means and no consciousness of itself as a continuing entity. Without the ability to desire itself as a continuing entity, Thule says a fetus has no right to life. Immediately, some of you might say, well, sometimes when people are hitting absolute rock bottom, they may not desire to live. Do they now lose their right to life? Thule says no. There are three situations where a person may not desire a right, but their right must remain upheld nonetheless. One, situations in which an individual's desires reflect a state of emotional disturbance. So if a suicidal patient tells their therapist, I don't really want to live anymore. And the therapist is like, cool, do your thing and lets the patient take their life, a right to life was still violated here. Two, situations in which a previously conscious individual is temporarily unconscious. When we're unconscious, we have no desires, but that doesn't mean it's suddenly okay to murder people in their sleep. Three, situations in which an individual's desires have been distorted by conditioning or by indoctrination. If someone tells you, dude, you gotta stab me to death in exactly seven minutes and eight nanoseconds because the prophet on Spadina just told me that everyone dead at uh, 6, 66 p.m. gets beamed up straight to heaven. Stabbing them would still be a violation of their right to life. I think most pro-choicers would agree with Thule up until now, or at least find nothing horribly wrong. But here's where we start to get a little cray-cray. Thule moves on to reject the validity of all the popular cutoff points in abortion discussions. Conception, the attainment of human form, mobility, viability, and birth. I'm going to focus specifically on why Thule rejects viability and birth since those are the most liberal views on abortion. And thus, if liberal positions can defend against his objections here, it gets rid of all the earlier cutoff points. Thule argues that birth has no moral relevance because it's just a change in location, whether the baby is inside the womb or outside it, whether it's physiologically dependent on its birth giver or not, does not change the baby's ability to be self-conscious, and hence does not change its right to life. Quote, consider a speculative case where a fetus is able to learn a language while in the womb. One would surely not say that the fetus has no right to life until it emerged from the womb or until it was capable of existing outside the womb. A newborn baby still fails to meet his self-consciousness requirement. And so, if we agree that aborting a viable, unborn baby is okay, then having that baby go from inside to outside makes no difference. Infanticide is morally acceptable so long as the baby has no self-consciousness. 
Now, before pro-lifers cheer at their seeming victory, Thule also thinks y'all wrong, even more so than pro-choice. Sorry, no one gets a break from him. He says that the conservative position may seem easier to defend. For one, they don't have to choose a morally arbitrary cutoff point of a fetus's development, and they don't have to specify what properties grant a right to life. They can just say that there is some property that all adult persons have. They don't know exactly what it is, and they don't have to. There just is a property, and this property bestows a right to life upon any organism that has it. Crucially then, anti-abortion positions rely on the potentiality principle. Quote, any organism potentially possessing that property has a serious right to life even now, simply by virtue of that potentiality. So if an organism, through its normal course of development, will possess this property, then don't wait. You can get a right to life in the next 10 seconds. Oh look, there you go. You're almost there. Keep rolling. You can stick the landing. And you're a winner. Congrats on being conceived, little fella. Here's your right to life. Don't ask me why my accent changed. That's just how I imagine sport commentators to sound like. The potentiality principle is what allows anti-abortionists to say that so long as you are part of the homo sapien species from a zygote on, you have a right to life. It also maybe allows them to argue that a fetus developing limbs and fingers is morally relevant. Not because physical traits themselves have moral relevance, but because they are a necessary causal step to developing future psychological traits that do matter. So let's search. Is there a property that gives an organism a right to life only because the property stands in a causal relationship to a second property? Thule describes the relationship like this. Let's say there is action A that initiates the causal process C, which normally leads to the outcome E. B is an action involving minimal effort that stops the process C before outcome E occurs. If we assume that A and B lead to no other consequences besides E, which I think is a fair assumption because being pregnant with a viable baby leads to birth, and abortion, the interference, stops birth, then there is moral symmetry between inaction and action. There is no moral difference between intentionally performing action B and intentionally refraining from performing action A, assuming identical motivation in both cases. Many philosophers disagree with this statement because there definitely seems to be a difference between our positive duties, or our duty to act, and our negative duties, or our duty to stay out of the way. Even if it is not wrong to send food to starving people in other parts of the world, it is more wrong still to kill someone. And isn't the conclusion then that one's obligation to refrain from killing someone is a more serious obligation than one's obligation to save lives? But Thule says that there isn't any moral difference in the duties themselves. The reason why this distinction seems to exist is based on the motivations we assume people have. Generally, we assume that I might refrain from, say, donating to charities because I'm apathetic or lazy or I just feel amoral about the situation, whereas to actively choose to kill someone is knowingly and purposely intending to cause death. However, if we make the motivations identical, then the distinction between positive and negative duties falls. Consider scenario 1, where Jones sees that Smith will be killed by a bomb unless he warns him. Jones' reaction is, how lucky, it will save me the trouble of killing Smith myself. So Jones allows Smith to be killed by the bomb, even though he could easily have warned him. Compare that to scenario 2. Jones wants Smith dead, classic and therefore shoots him. It doesn't feel like one scenario is far worse than another. Jones feels like the cause of Smith's death in both cases, even if scenario one was due to his inaction. Moreover, we instinctively feel a difference between action and inaction because, well, action involves effort. For most people, refraining from killing someone doesn't require effort. I hope. But saving someone's life will. And if the required effort is a lot, then we don't see you as morally obligated to do it. But Thule says this doesn't point to a difference in moral duty. 
Rather, it's about weighing a person's own right to do what they want with their life against another person's right to life. With all this setup out of the way, here's Thule's refutation against the potentiality principle. Suppose at some future time, a chemical were to be discovered, which, when injected into the brain of a kitten, actually, I'm gonna replace kitten with a less likable animal, cause some of y'all are way too obsessed with cats. Suppose at some future time, a chemical were to be discovered, which, when injected into the brain of a crocodile, would cause the crocodile to develop into a crocodile possessing a brain of the sort possessed by humans, and consequently, into a crocodile having all the psychological capabilities characteristic of adult humans. Such crocodiles would be able to think, to use language, and so on. Crocodiles with this injection would now be self-conscious organisms, and thus, they would have a serious right to life, just like any other person. But this doesn't mean it's wrong to not inject the crocodile with the chemical and kill it instead. Just because it is possible to transform a crocodile into having a person-like brain doesn't mean it has a right to life before the transformation. You can still think killing them is wrong, but it's not any more wrong than it is in status quo, where there is no potential for brain-altering chemicals. If you remember the moral symmetry principle we talked about earlier, there is no moral difference between intentionally performing action B and intentionally refraining from performing action A, assuming identical motivation in both cases, then according to this principle, if it isn't seriously wrong to refrain from initiating a causal process, in other words, if it isn't seriously wrong to not inject the crocodile, then it also isn't seriously wrong to interfere with that process. For example, let's say you're an absolute klutz and you accidentally inject crocodile 405 with the brain altering chemical. But oh shit, crocodile 405 is supposed to be skinned and butchered in preparation for Gordon Ramsay, who's coming to pick up the crocodile in 15 bloody minutes. Not only will your boss fire you once they hear you've turned an ingredient into Master Croc, but you'll have a scowling Scottish man demolish any smidge of respect you have for yourself in every curse word possible. Right, don't whistle at me, I'm not your fucking dog, yeah? You look more like a dog than I do. Fuck off, will you? I wouldn't wish that upon my worst enemy. There is a glimmer of hope though. The brain transformation doesn't happen until two hours later. Before the two hour mark, the crocodile possesses zero person-like capabilities and characteristics and is certainly not self-conscious. You can kill the crocodile right now and would be like killing any other crocodile before an injection. As long as it hasn't developed the properties that grant a right to life, there can be nothing wrong with interfering with the causal process. But if you believe that potential is sufficient to grant a right to life now, then you must accept that you cannot butcher this completely normal crocodile. You must face the consequences of losing your job and being haunted by Gordon Ramsay's words forever. Fucking dog, yeah, you look more like a dog than I do. Fuck off, will you? Quote, but if it is not seriously wrong to destroy an injected crocodile, which will naturally develop the properties that bestow a right to life, neither can it be seriously wrong to destroy a member of Homo sapiens, which lacks such properties, but will naturally come to have them. Forty years later, Ubellini and Minerva, whom I'll refer to as GNM from now on, advance similar arguments to Thule, but they add a bit more medical context. They say that most, if not all, pro-choicers think that it's valid to get an abortion if a fetus is found to have severe abnormalities that would not only make the baby's life extremely difficult, but also the family's, especially if they are financially struggling or are a single parent. But what do we do when the exact same conditions that would have justified abortion are only discovered after birth or during delivery? One example is the case of treacher collins syndrome, or TCS, a condition that affects one in every 10,000 births, causing facial deformity and related physiological failures, in particular, potentially life-threatening respiratory problems. Many parents choose to get an abortion if, through genetic prenatal testing, their fetus is found to be affected by TCS. 
However, tests are usually taken only if there is family history of TCS, but they can affect babies with perfectly healthy family histories. These tests are also very expensive. The parents who are less likely to pay for these tests are the same parents who have less access to parenting resources. It can already be difficult for these parents to raise a healthy baby, much less a baby with TCS. And look, I get that pro-life and especially religious pro-life folk believe in the motto, all life is precious, regardless of what state the baby is born in. But maybe pregnant parents wouldn't feel the need to get an abortion if society was better equipped to include disabled and handicapped persons. The truth is, society sucks at providing accessibility measures and prohibiting parents from getting an abortion when they know their child and family will struggle is exploitative of those parents. Secondly, GNM say that there are already cases where killing a child due to unbearable suffering is allowed. The Netherlands has what's called the Groningen Protocol, which permits life termination of children facing endless suffering and most likely incurable conditions. Lastly, GNM decide to use the term afterbirth abortion instead of infanticide in order to emphasize that the moral status of the individual killed is comparable to that of a fetus rather than a child. Quote, Therefore, we claim that killing a newborn could be ethically permissible in all the circumstances where abortion would be. As to why newborns and fetuses have the same moral status, their arguments are very similar to Thule's, so I won't go much into that. But feel free to read their paper if you are interested. Okay, so when do Thule and GNM's arguments actually become relevant to real life? I think a good answer to that is born alive babies. These are babies that are unintentionally born alive during a failed attempted abortion. And the question is, what are physicians supposed to do in these circumstances? Now, philosophers like Thule and GNM have an easy response. Kill the damn thing. It's fresh out of the womb. It has no self-consciousness and no aims, so it doesn't have a right to life. It's okay, they say these things in theory, but in political practice, it would never be defended. We're talking about infanticide, but two, two Republican presidential candidates are accusing President Obama of voting in favor of making the killing of newborn children legal. In 1985, a Texas physician was sentenced to 15 years in prison for delivering an infant girl by hysterectomy which is when you remove all or part of the uterus, and then proceeded to drown that infant in a bucket of water. In 2000, Jill Stanick, a nurse, testified that born alive babies at her hospital were being left to die alone in a utility closet. Bird babies were being aborted alive and shelved to die in the hospital's soiled utility room. And in 2006, Gloria Williams was having an abortion when the fetus was unexpectedly born moving and gasping for air. An owner of the abortion clinic came in, cut the fetus's umbilical cord, placed it in a biohazard bag, and plopped it in the trash. Cases like these prompted the creation of the Born Alive Infant Protection Act in the United States, which extended legal protection to babies born after failed abortion attempts. Now, if you know anything about US politics, they don't tend to agree on stuff. But for this bill, it passed both houses of Congress without a single dissenting vote. It was a 98 to zero vote in the Senate. And that's what we expect. I mean, it doesn't look so good for a politician to say that they are willing to kill a born alive baby, right? Well, in Illinois, it was not as smooth of a process. Obama, amongst others, were worried that the Illinois Born Alive Infants Protection Act would unjustly limit the right to abortion. What if parents now feel burdened to keep the child despite having really wanted or needed an abortion? Could this deter pregnant parents from seeking abortions in the second or third trimester, even if they've been victims of rape or have zero financial capability to raise this child? Will this also deter more physicians from performing labor-induced abortions? And that essentially adding a, an additional doctor who then has to be called in an emergency situation to come in and make these assessments is really designed simply to burden the original decision uh, of the woman and the physician 
to induce labor and perform an abortion. I think that these are valid concerns if you claim to support abortion for all three trimesters of pregnancy. These are cases that we don't like to face, but if you are pro-choice, then I think this is a really important problem to navigate. As heartless as he may sound, I think Obama's stance on born alive babies unveils a problem for common pro-choice positions. The exact problem Thule and GNM point out. If a fetus is born an hour later, it seems to have the exact same level of moral personhood outside the womb as it did when it was inside. Both of them have the same physiological traits and mental capacities. Neither recognizes itself as a continuing moral agent with aims. It seems then that Obama took the widest stance possible to avoid this inconsistency in his pro-choice agenda. But are Thule, GNM, and Obama correct? Does birth really have no moral significance? I spent a lot of time explaining the content in Thule and GNM's papers because I wanted to present a thorough, charitable version of their arguments. Now that we hopefully have a good grasp of what they were saying, we can now get into their flaws. The main reason why Thule and GNM proclaim infanticide of newborns is okay is because they see no moral significance in the change of location. Viable fetus versus newborn baby is just a semantic change, but they are both morally equivalent beings. But is birth really just a change in location? The way I might move from one part of the room to another? In Rini's paper, Of Course the Baby Should Live, Rini agrees that a person is someone with a right to life. To have a right to life, they must be self-conscious of their existence and ascribe value to it in such a way that they consciously desire its continuation. Very similar definition to Thule and GNM. But she takes a crucial step that they don't. She describes two logically distinct ways to attribute value to one's existence. In one way, an individual can value their existence directly. This is basically Thule's self-consciousness requirement, where an individual is aware of themselves as the subject of their life, and they directly value the continuation of their own experiential states. Quote, In this case, the individual attributes value to her existence itself, regardless of anything else. The other way an individual can value their existence is indirectly. An individual values something that requires their continued existence to achieve that thing. For example, I'm a baby, goo goo gaga, I, I want, want mommy, mommy, I, I want, want milk, milk, and I need to continue to exist for me to slurp that mommy milk. Notice that this does not require the individual to have any attitude toward her existence itself, or even to be able to conceptualize her existence. I can want mommy's milk without being aware of my own self-existence. We are left then with two definitions of a moral person. One, a moral person is an individual capable of conceiving of herself as the subject of a life that she values. Two, a moral person is an individual capable of valuing certain aims, for which the continuation of her life is instrumentally necessary. Okay, so which definition were Thule and GNM using? Well, number one is too strong to be plausible. It would require the individual to conceive of themselves as the subject of their life and also understand what it would mean to value that life. This would not only exclude newborn babies, but also some developmentally disabled adult humans. In fact, GNM say that many non-human animals and mentally disabled human individuals are persons. So, I guess they adopted the weaker definition, number two. This definition does not exclude developmentally disabled adults, nor certain non-human animals. Although they may not be able to have sophisticated self-conceptions, they do have aims. But Rini is confused as to why infants are excluded from this. Do babies not have aims? GNM merely assert that Hardly can a newborn be said to have aims. It does not seem to me that they provide a convincing argument for this assertion. True, a newborn infant does not have very sophisticated aims, nor a particularly sophisticated conception of its future. But even a newborn infant does exhibit preferences for warmth, for food, for physical contact. It experiences pleasure and pain as linked to the satisfaction or frustration of these preferences, and it will do the tiny things within its power, grasping, suckling, crying, 
to bring about the fulfillment of these preferences. It seems plausible to me to call all of these things aims in a newborn infant, or at least I can't see any justification for refusing to call these things aims, and yet insisting that many non-human animals do have aims. And the reason why born babies have aims and fetuses do not is because the change in location during birth is morally relevant. When a fetus is inside the womb, it is entirely dependent on the pregnant parent. All its needs are provided directly through its umbilical cord and uterus environment. It is completely passive in regards to its own needs. But when that fetus comes out into the world, its umbilical cord is snapped, its lovely uterus home is gone, and it must now breathe on its own, process its own nutrients, generate its own bodily warmth. A newborn becomes biologically independent. It now needs to actively seek out the fulfillment of its own needs. And they immediately do whatever their little squishy bodies can to signal that they want to fulfill these needs by crying and suckling and yelling. Ugh. You're telling me that I have to signal for food myself now? I can't just wait for someone else to eat? God, being born sucks. Being born also situates you in a social context that didn't exist beforehand. In abortion, infanticide, and moral context, Lindsay Porter argues that infanticide and abortion are alike in theory. In reality though, they will never be the same because they occur in different moral contexts. She says that just because something has a right to life doesn't mean you automatically have the thumbs up to go for the kill. Take tree lobsters, for example. They have the same intrinsic right to life as any other little insect that we squash with zero remorse, aka no right to life. And yet, it is morally impermissible to kill tree lobsters not because they have a right to life, but because they are an endangered species. If they were just as common as ants, then we'd probably also drown them with Nerf water guns. I, I never did that when I was seven. Some friend told me that they did that when they were seven. This shows that there are facts external to the tree lobster, such as the biological ecosystem and their relationship to it, that influence the permissibility of killing them. It's not just about the rights a tree lobster has, or the lack of rights in this case. Neither newborns nor fetuses are an endangered species, but just like tree lobsters, there are non-intrinsic facts about them that are relevant to moral claims about them. In theorizing about permissible treatment of fetuses and newborns, we cannot simply look at their intrinsic features. We cannot consider fetuses and newborns in isolation. Context matters. In the same manner, as soon as a baby is born, it stands in a complex relation to many people, whereas pre-birth, it had a unique, single relationship with the pregnant parent. A fetus is a part of its parent, and its relationship with others were mere potential. But a born baby solidifies its place in social relations. Pregnancy is the only relationship where providing one being, the fetus, with medical care for its benefit is impossible to do without also doing something to the pregnant parent. You literally cannot perform operations, checkups, or prescribe medication for the fetus without the cooperation and consent of the pregnant parent, unless you force them to comply against their will. But once the baby is born, it gains independence. It branches out from this unique single relationship. The moral context has changed. The reason why so many discussions overlook the moral significance of birth is because the mainstream outlook on moral rights theory rests on two assumptions. First, when discussing who has what moral right, the justifications revolve around intrinsic properties. When you look at and listen to abortion discussions, the right to life debate is always about what does a fetus or an adult essentially have? Do you have a conscious concept of self? Are your organs able to keep you alive independently? Do you have hands? 
These are all intrinsic properties, relational social properties, such as being loved, being part of a social community, or a biological ecosystem. These are rarely cited as relevant to the discussion, and I definitely think they should be. Second is the single criterion assumption, which assumes that there is one key property that determines whether something has moral rights or not. People try really hard to come up with one special cutoff point where before it, abortion is totally okay, but after it, it's completely evil. Or people will talk about how a single right must prevail. It's always either right to life is the key property or right to bodily autonomy is what truly matters. This single criterion assumption doesn't allow for the possibility of a variety of sound reasons for ascribing moral rights. It doesn't allow us to say, hey, let's look at intrinsic rights, but let's also look at relationships to family and to society at large. Abortion discussions can get frustrating when you feel like you hear the same arguments over and over again. Hopefully through this video, you might have come across something new. If you didn't get enraged by this video, you can like and sub if you want, leave a comment if you want, Please try to be respectful, but I understand this topic is touchier for some than others. I know I didn't cover a lot of the popular abortion arguments, but that wasn't the purpose of this video. I wanted to focus on a specific philosophical discussion that interested me. I would highly recommend reading the papers I've talked about in this video if you have the time and are interested in getting the most detailed version of this discussion. Thank you so much for watching. Let's keep talking, and I hope to hear from you soon. Bye!